to start off with my prayer. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you have given me, especially, especially this opportunity to give this talk tonight. Please enlighten my mind and please strengthen me. I ask this through Jesus Christ, my Lord. This talk is about my family, my friends, and my faith. Um, I'll talk about, first about my family. I have, uh, Larry and I have six children, 18 grandchildren, <laughs> and been blessed with two great-grandchildren recently. Oh. Our little Eleanor Marie, Ellie, and just Monday we were blessed with a little boy, William Lawrence. So God has been so good, and to hold these babies is unbelievable. <laughs> I've asked my children f for before, and I said, why don't we have another baby in the family? And they looked at me and said, Mom, go out to Walgreens, get yourself some baby oil and some baby powder, and it'll be just like having a baby. And I said, uh, that's wrong. Okay. Now I have my babies, and I am so grateful to God for, this, for these gifts. Um, Larry and I have been in this parish for 53 years, uh, and our children were, went to school here. I am a homemaker and a retired homemaker. Now you wonder why I say a retired homemaker. I'm retired because I don't cook anymore. In fact, just now we went over to this restaurant on Dempster Avenue and we had called Just Like Home. That's where I tell Larry, that's where I am now. It's, my kitchen is just at home. Um, this journey that I'm going to take with you tonight is a journey of uh, struggling, I struggled with my prayer life. I struggled with my Lord. Uh, I've questioned him many, many times, like I think most of us have to question. I've uh, struggled with uh, the question why. I think we all question the why in our lives. I've uh, asked him many times, like, what are the reasons for these different things that you have given me in my life? And I haven't gotten the answer that I want, and I think all of us have not gotten the answer that we want, but we go on asking. And this is what I have done. But it's, it's, not, well, it's not always been hard, because I've always had God in my life, and I've always had Christ in my life. And they have led me to the right answers and the right decisions. This journey is it happened 24 years ago. It happened to our son Michael, and Michael's right back here to give me support. Um, he met a wonderful, beautiful girl, our Beth, and I think you know Beth Sebastian. You know the Sebastian family from the from the parish, and we were very fortunate in having both our families meet each other and to grow together and and continue the family. Uh, relationship. Uh, we've laughed together, we've cried together, we've done many things together, we've taken trips together, our family have grown together. So when Mike and Beth started to date, Joan said to me, I hope this doesn't break up our relationship. And I said, how could they break up our relationship? They're just falling in love. They can't do anything wrong with that. Well, time went on and Beth and, and uh, Michael got engaged. And they were supposed to be married July 10th, 1987. And July 3rd, 1987, our older son, Kevin, decided to give them a bachelor, Michael, a bachelor party. And he didn't want the regular bachelor party. He wanted to have them all come up to the lake and have a golf outing and have a barbecue and then just fool around in the water. So the day came, it was a gorgeous day, and they did go out, play golf. And they came back and they did have a barbecue. And it was a lot of fun and a lot of laughs. And we always prouded ourselves in the fact that our, our water was shallow, and our grandchildren and children could play in the water, and we weren't too worried about it getting deep. So they all got their swimming suits on, and they all went out and started fooling around. Well, as kids will be, and as young adults will be, the fun began. So there was one push to Michael, and then there was a second push to Michael, and the third push was the push that started 
the problem. I was sitting on the shore with one of his friends, and I said to Sean, I think there's a problem down there. And he said, no, I think you better stay here with me. And I kept saying, no, Sean. Mother intuition says I better go down and see what's happening. And Sean said, no, I think you better stay here. Well, I was fighting with Sean and fighting with my intuition, and Sean won the fight. And all I could see of them all around Michael, and there was a lot of confusion. And I kept saying to Sean, what's happening, Sean? He said, oh, no, I think Michael just got a mouthful of water. And I said, no, no, no. There's more than a mouthful of water happening down there. And just at the same time, the police boat was coming in for the night, and they're yelling out to the police boat, call 911. I thought, oh, my God. I felt like Mary. I thought, there was Mary standing on the side watching her son walking down the path to the cross. And I thought, there's something wrong. Only a mother can help their, their children. And please let me go. And Sean said, no, you can't go. And in the meantime, Rich, his other partner, friend, had been a paramedic. And he was gently taking Michael out of the water. And I said, oh, I know it's more than just fooling around. And as that happened, the paramedics came up and put Michael on a stretcher and took him up the stairs. And I said, oh my God, what has happened? And the paramedics were paramedics and they do a good job and I'm thankful for them. But again, they're very strict in their decisions. And they said they were taking them to a uh, satellite station to examine him and make a decision. And I said, I'm coming with you. And they said, no, you can't come. And I said, now wait a minute, I'm the mother. I can come. They said, no, you cannot come. I thought, oh, there again, there's Mary with her disappointment with Jesus. And I thought, this can't be. I'm the mother. Again, no, you cannot come. And Michael was being carried up to the uh, roadway, and he turned to me and he said, I'm okay, Mom. I can move my fingers. And I thought, oh, Michael, either I'm naive, naive or you're naive. So as they carried him up the road and put him in the ambulance, the ambulance said to us, follow us to the satellite station. And we said, well, where is the satellite station? They said, just follow us. Well, now it's dark, and you know what it is in the city, in the country. The roads are dark. Everything is dark. So we did. Larry and I followed them. And I believe Joe Sebastian did, too. This is Beth's dad. Uh, Beth wasn't there. She was, needless to say, she wasn't coming to a bachelor party. So we followed and followed and followed and finally got to the station. And they brought Mike into the examining room, and we waited, and we waited, and all I could think of was Mary. Mary going through all that time waiting for Jesus and watching Jesus be up, going up the passageway to, to the cross and carrying that cross and falling and carrying that cross and falling. And, my whole mind was on, on Mary. I kept thinking, oh my God, how she has gone through the passion of our Lord. And I, I don't like silence, and everybody who knows me knows that. I don't like to be quiet, and I don't like silence. And I kept thinking, somebody say something, somebody do something. And believe me, and this might sound funny to you, I couldn't pray. I could not pray. I started the Hail Mary, and it went blank. I could not finish it. I said, there's something wrong here. Why can't I pray? This is the time I should be praying. And I couldn't. I just could not pray. So finally, the, the doctor came out of the, uh, of the room, the examining room, and they said, uh, we have to take him to Freighter Hospital. And I said, Freighter Hospital? Where is that? He said, that's in Milwaukee. And I thought, Milwaukee? We don't live in Milwaukee. Why would you be taking my son to Milwaukee? Well, as you know, July 3rd 
It was the 4th of July weekend, and all the uh, uh, hospital beds in the rehab, our rehab uh, hospital, were filled. And there wasn't any helicopter to take them to the rehab station, the rehab hospital. So they called one in Wisconsin and carried him, we were taking him to Freighter Hospital. Well, Freighter Hospital is like telling me to go to Alaska. I had no idea. We had no idea where Freighter Hospital was. Again, a total mystery to us. And the doctor said, I believe he said, and I could be wrong, and Michael could correct me, I believe he said he had broken his neck. Well, that was another shock to us. Then everything started running through our minds. And broken deck, he's supposed to get married. Why, Lord? Why, Lord? Why, Lord? You know, the Lord doesn't send tragedies. tragedies. He, that's not what he sends. He sends us crosses, but he doesn't send a tragedy. But there was no answer, and so I kept saying, why and why? But I had my, I had to have my faith, and I had to remember that whatever the Lord sends us, he also gives us the graces to go through these crosses. So again, back in the car, well, not quite yet, they, the helicopter came, and I said, okay, now I'm going to get into the helicopter with my, no. Again, refused to get into the helicopter. Mike had to go on by himself. So I kept saying, but I'm the mother, and he's by, I don't want him to be by himself. But Mike did have to go by himself in the helicopter. So Larry and I got in the car, and we're on our way to Milwaukee, not knowing where Freighter Hospital was. It was just like, get in the car, go, and you'll find it. Well, we drove and we drove and we drove and we drove. And I drove in silence. Larry drove in silence again. Could not pray. Could not even say an Our Father or Hail Mary, and knowing now that he had broken his neck. Well, they pulled in Freighter Hospital and found Michael, and they decided they'd do the surgery. I believe it was at night they were going to do the surgery, and they did. And by that time, Joe and Joan had come to the hospital and more of our family. And when the doctor came out, he looked at us, and he said, I have good news and I have bad news for you. And we said, well, what is it? We're ready. We're ready. He said, the good news is that he'll be able to drive a car. Well, that's fine. And now what is the bad news? He said, the bad news is he'll never walk again. Well, didn't think his sense of humor was good. Didn't like what I heard. And then it was total silence. And all of a sudden, we're thinking like, the good news and the bad news? He'll drive a car? How can he drive a car and not walk? It just didn't make sense to me. I, there, there, there's something wrong with this doctor's, quite, this doctor's uh, explanation. And I think I asked him again, and typical, sometimes the doctors will be, he said, I told you, in this tone of voice, he'll be able to drive, but he will not be able to walk. And he walked away. <laughs> Well, you can imagine the questions we had to, to ask him, but he didn't have the time to answer our questions right there and then. So now it began, what do we do? First of all, we had to cancel the wedding. We had to cancel all the plans that were being made for the next week. But we have wonderful friends and family who took over and did all the canceling for us. And then we had to find a place to stay. We didn't know where we were going to stay, and so we went to the desk and they said to us, well, it's like oh, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, we could offer you to stay at McDonald House, but really Michael's not of age, but you can try. So we went over to McDonald House and they said, well, again, Michael's not of age, but we do have one room and we'll offer that to you. So we stayed at Michael at McDonald's house for six weeks with the understanding that if they ever needed that we would have to move out. Well, we moved out for three days one time and then we were asked, we were asked to come back. I cannot tell you 
what a wonderful experience that we had at McDonald House. They were so gracious and so wonderful and so welcoming to us. And, and the people that were there every night would share their different experience with their different problems, their crosses that they had. Now these people, most of them had little children, either dying of cancer or dying of something. And they'd come back and we'd all sit around and we would share. It, it was a wonderful experience when you were in need of somebody with support and somebody to talk to because your days were long. And at this time, Michael, after his surgery, he was put into a striker bed. Now, a striker bed is a bed that, that turns him upside down. And the reason that a, they need to put him in that so that he doesn't get bed sores. Besides, he was also put in a halo. And it was the worst day we've ever had, is to walk in and see him in a striker bed and a halo. And I don't have to tell you what the halo reminded us of, of Christ on the cross with a crown in his head. This, this halo was just like a crown he put into the temple of his head and then to see him upside down. I don't know what saint was hung upside down, but it did remind me of a saint being hung, hung upside down. And there's where he was for the main reason of not to get bed sores and to keep the pressure off of his neck and his head. Well, I guess you can only take so much, but there is God always giving you the grace to carry on. And Michael has a good sense of humor, and he always had a remark for us, and we always had to laugh, so he, he does have a wonderful sense of humor. And during these six weeks, we had friends come up to visit us. I had my two best friends, Joyce and Peg, visit. We had priests from St. Paul of the Cross come up to visit us. And then they said they would have a prayer service, and they did. And believe me, the night that they had the prayer service at St. Paul here, I could feel the power of prayers because it was the most peaceful night that we had at Freighter. It, 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 we knew that they were praying for Michael. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience for, for us and for the parish where our community was praying for Michael and for all the intentions that we had. So that took us um, at Freighter for six weeks. We had a lot of laughs. Mary, my daughter, uh, decided she was going to have bird seed, which is... Uh, <laughs> M&M's and penis and what else, Mary? Pretzels, but it's a big bowl. It was huge. And every time Larry would see us into the bird seat, he would get so upset. Well, it was our nervous food, so we, had, we would pick at it all until the very end, until the six weeks were up. But that was, that was the funny thing. They, go, they would say, there they go, they're into the bird seat again. Mm -hmm. And Beth, Beth Sebastian, <laughs> she and I were into the Doritos, the uh, sour cream Doritos, until one night we both got very, very sick. So that was the end. <laughs> don't ever mention, if you see Beth Sebastian or Brian, don't ever mention Doritos to her because she will just get sick standing right there. So that, that is the six weeks at Freighter Hospital. But we learned that we could turn to God. We can turn to our Christ, we can turn to him, and he will answer our prayers. He'll give us the strength, and, um, and he will not let us down, and he didn't let us down. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was an accident, and an accident that just happened, and we had to go through with it the rest of our life, or less of Michael's life. I learned through this that prayer, that St. Paul said, is you can... Love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes in all things, and endures all things. And I became very strong through all of this. The reason I became very, very strong is because um, Michael had to come home and uh, after he went to the rehab, and I had to be challenged when Michael came home. 
And Michael had to learn to drive. And that was another challenge that Michael had to take, is to learn to drive. And we could not understand how Michael could drive a car. And he, he was paralyzed from his chest down and very little movement in his hands. But he did. He learned to drive. And I remember coming over here and asking Father Kinane to bless his car. And Father Kinane said, fine, but let me get back into the rectory before he gets on the road again. <laughs> <laughs> Michael has been driving ever since he learned to drive. Uh, how many years? 20, 27 years ago. And he's a good driver. He hasn't had an accident yet, nor a ticket. So he's better than his mother, I'll tell you. <laughs> So uh, Michael is driving, he works for Honeywell, it's not called Honeywell now, but he has been working for them ever since the accident. And the strangest thing about this is when Michael was, right before his uh, marriage, the, the insurance company came in and asked if they would take disability insurance out. And he came home and he said to a, Larry and myself, he said, you think we should take, I should take disability insurance out? And Dad said, well, I don't know, you know, how much it is, how much is it? And he said, uh, not that much. And he said, well, you know, if it's not that much, you're young, you might as well try and take, take it out. So he did. He was the only one in his company that took disability insurance out. Oh. Today, you know, what, what the insurance has done for him. So God, God has been present in his life, in our life, all this time. All this time. So anyway, we go on with Michael, and uh, when he came home, he went to the rehab, and the rehab was a wonderful place. There, we met so many wonderful people. Noreen, a nurse there who has helped, helped Michael when he came home, and uh, she has, has passed away, says, but it was, it was Michael's right arm. He, she was wonderful to Michael. She helped me to learn how to take care of Michael when he came home. I was afraid when Michael came home. I didn't know if I was strong enough to take care of him. Um, it, it's hard because you have to turn him. I had to turn him a couple times during the night, and I didn't know whether I could do that. Pick him up and put him in his wheelchair, help him get dressed. And I, I, that frightened me because I didn't know if I could handle that. But to the grace of God, yes, I did that, and we did get along pretty good. Right, Mike? <laughs> oh, here and there. <laughs> but anyways, uh, Michael went off to work. Uh, he learned to drive. He went off to work. And then we had an opportunity in September of uh, 1988, Michael and Beth had not gotten married yet, to go to Lourdes. And Larry found out there was a, uh, a plane full of um, handicapped and disability people going to Lourdes uh, from Boston. And so we asked Mike and Beth and our daughter, Kathy and Bob and Matthew. A little short story about our Matthew. Our Matthew was four years old at that time. Uh, he has cerebral palsy. He was born not knowing at the time, but the, but uh, maybe a year later, they noticed he wasn't being developed, right? And so they found out that he had cerebral palsy. Kathy lost her first baby 10 minutes after birth, and then she, got, she had Matthew, and then to find out that he had cerebral palsy. The doctor told Kathy and Bob that Matthew would not live past three years old. Matthew right now is 27 years old. He is our angel. Uh, Matthew has, uh, if you met him today, and I wish he was here, but he's at, a, he's at another, uh, uh, another event for his cousin who's getting some uh, awards. He doesn't stop. Kathy and Bob uh, take him anywhere and everywhere. He's been to Medjugorje. He's been on more trips than probably you and I have ever been. But then we took him to uh, Lourdes, and you all know the reason why we took them to Lourdes asking for a miracle. And when we got there, uh, it was such a wonderful experience. Uh, the people, they were just so supporting and so gracious and so outgoing and so caring. It, it's like you knew them all your life. They were just uh, wonderful, wonderful people. And we got to the point where it was time to take the uh, bath. And Michael did. And 
I said, man, she was four years old. And he doesn't talk. He has all his needs have to be taken care of. And so they put him in the water. Well, needless to say, <laughs> he wasn't too happy about that. That was one day. And so the next day, Kathy and Bob said, well, we'll try one more time. We'll put him in the bath. And no, that wasn't what he wanted to do. And then the last day, Kathy said, please, I want to put you in the bath one more time. Now, Matthew does not speak too clearly and too well. He said, no. And they said, if he can say no, then we know he doesn't want to take another bath. So to, the, to this day, Matthew uh, is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful child. Uh, not child, he's a young man. And he brings us more joy than we can ever tell you, I can never tell you about. So we came back from, we were, came back to the, our, our hotel room and we sat down in one of the rooms just to talk about our experience in Lourdes. And we sat on the beds and we said, uh, Larry started out and he said, let's open it up and say, what did we get from this trip? And there was silence. And then finally one after another said, well, we came for a miracle. And there, there wasn't the miracle that we came for, but there is a miracle. The miracle for both families was the acceptance. They got the acceptance of their cross. And now they go on with life with what they were given. And with God at their side and Our Lady at their side. So it was a miracle. We did get our miracle. And to this day, both Beth and Michael have accepted whatever God has given them. Kathy and Bob have accepted whatever God has given them. And they have been, both of the families have been, they live beautiful lives. They, live, they do more than Larry and I do. Much more than Larry and I do, believe me. <laughs> but they are, they're very happy in, in their lives. So on July 10th, 1987, most beautiful day, Mike and Beth walked down St. Paul's Isle and got married. And that was the beginning of their life, a new life together. I can't tell you how God has been so good to the both of them. They have their struggles, they have their good times and their bad times, but God has been good. Beth, Beth could walk out the day after the accident. She didn't have to stay. Many, many girls do walk out. They don't have to say, but Beth is the most beautiful girl you'd ever want to meet. Very strong, very acceptance, very loving. And she stayed with Mike through all of this. And we are so grateful to have Beth in our life. So we have much to be thankful for. So, and uh, on August, they waited, and on August 15th, Beth and Mike adopted a little girl, our Katie. Katie is a senior now in high school, looking for a college, and she is our blessing. She's another blessing that God is giving. All these blessings, it, it, I mean, there's, I can go on and go on about blessings, and all through prayer, and all through people that were brought into our lives, and Mike's life, and Beth's life, there's just so many things, and it's all been through prayer. It's all been through prayer and acting, asking God, to bless us and to bless the, to bless them. It, it, I I can't tell you how much, how much God has been present in our life. We just through it. We'll call it a tragedy. Call it an accident. Call it whatever you want. We could have carried those crosses and been mad and and been angry at God. But why? Because life goes on. You all have crosses. You all have journeys in your life. You all have things that are happening in your lives today. You either choose to accept them or you choose not to accept them. But that's your choice. But if you choose to accept them with God and with Our Lady, it's so much easier. It's so much easier. Because they'll, they'll, they'll be there with you. They'll never let you down. They'll never let you down. God is always there with you. And so there's so much that we have to learn and it's caring for each other. We have to care for each other. If we don't reach out to each other and care for each other, what is this world about? We need to learn that we're all human beings and we all need to uh, be loved and to be hugged and to be uh, 
welcome. I mean, this world doesn't have that anymore. We don't have that caring, that loving, that hugging, that touching. We're all afraid to do that. We're all afraid that, you know, it's not right to do, it's not the right thing to do. But we do, we need to, we need to hug each other. We need to love each other. We need to touch each other, to talk to each other. And we don't do that. We all got those cell phones and whatever, texting or whatever they, we do. We don't have that conversation anymore, but we need to go ahead and we need to do that. If not, we, we won't be carrying our cross. I remember hearing a story about the crosses. God, this man was complaining about his cross and God said, well, come on into this room with me. And he said, here, here's all these crosses. You know, you probably all have heard this before, but it's a, to me it's a beautiful story. And I think of it so often when I complain. Here's all these crosses. Okay, put your cross over here, and you know, now go out and pick another cross. So he goes through the whole room and he looks and looks and looks and looks, and finally he picks up this cross and brings it back to God. And he's, God says, Oh, this is the cross you want? And he says, Yes, this is the cross I want. He says, The same cross that I gave you. He says, Now right, go out and take your cross and bear it. And he said, And I'll help you carry it. And that's what it is. If you ask God to help you carry it, God will help you carry any cross that you have, only by asking and praying. So I, I ask you to think about our crosses. Think about caring for other people. Think about the things in your life that be thankful for the things in your life. We all have a lot to be thankful for. We all have a lot to be thankful for. And I learned that if I still have I've learned that I have a, I am still on a journey, and I will be on a journey until God says, come on. I'm still on a journey, and I have to realize that my faith, my love for Christ, I need to learn to take uh, steps, footsteps with him, and learn to go out and, and try to, every day, to find some happiness, and, 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 and touch people, and talk to people, and not to be afraid to, to um, welcome people into my life. I mean, we're, we're afraid of that, and we, we can't be afraid because we have a lot to give. We have an awful lot. God gives, has given us so much that we have to give back an awful lot. I have to focus on my family, my friends, the needs of, my, of others, and, um, my work, and doing the very best I can. And I, and I have to find that I learned that I need to, dis, to open my heart to other people and to do things, that I, to reach out and to smile. And if you look at the word care, C-A-R-E, it says Christ's arms reaching out to each other. So I ask each one of you right now to reach out to each other by a smile, by a touch, by a hug. And that's what the word care says. Thank you. Um, would you mind sharing with us um, what you see would be the proper way or the right way uh, for a person when they encounter a person with a disability? How to react towards them? Well, that's a good question, Jeff. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of a person with a disability. Uh, reach out to them. Because there's nothing worse, and I've seen it with Mike, where they avoid them. They did that when I used to take them to work. They would walk around him, walk around me, and I thought, well, he doesn't have a disease that you can catch. But go up to him. Make him feel welcome. They're as human as you and I are. There's nothing wrong with this. It's just that they have a disability, especially children, especially children. How many times we see a child in a buggy? With the, if sometimes the mothers don't allow it, and that's fine, then you walk away. But the child, no, our Matthew, does, he is the most loving child. If he, when he was little, he would take your hand and kiss it. I mean, he just, they have so much love, but they don't know how to give it unless you give it to them first. So you need to reach out. It's just like I said, reach out. Everybody needs to, everybody wants a hug. Everybody wants I would think so. I mean, there are people I know are, are, are distant, but
But what's a, what does a smile cost every, any, any of us? What's a smile? What does a smile cost? Nothing. I can smile. If you don't want to smile back to, back to me, that's okay. But I can smile. And it, it, it does, it opens my heart. It, it's, it's me bringing Christ to somebody else. It's all I feel like. It's my bringing Christ to somebody else. I mean, I have to, I have to bring Christ out. I mean, Christ is, we're putting Christ in, in a terrible position these days. We're, we're hiding him, and we can't do that. If we're Christians, and we're told to welcome people and, and, and to show our faith, I mean, I don't mean go stand on a corner or everything like that, but how else can do it but smile? I mean, a simple smile, that's all we have to do. Uh, what does it cost? <laughs> Nothing. His face gets a little stiff after a while, but hey, no big deal. But we have a lot to do. I mean, we got a lot. We got a, we're on a journey, all of us. We're on a journey, and God expects us to continue. And if we don't continue, eh, it's a boring life, anyways. Who wants to be bored? I got, I got lots of time in my hands. Not a lots of time. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? I thank you for all coming, especially my guild and my dear friends. It's wonderful to see your smiling faces out there. So thank you. And now I'll give it to Jeff.